This morning we like to draw your attention to the 12th chapter of Exodus, verses 12 and 13. Exodus 12, 12 and 13. Here the Lord is speaking to Moses. And the Lord said to him, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God is declaring to Moses that the day has finally come when he is going to visit his judgment upon Egypt. The first thing I notice is how patient God has been with the Egyptians. They had been afflicting the people of God for years. In fact, Moses was now 80 years old. And when he was born, his parents had to hide him because the Pharaoh at that time had ordered all of the baby boys born to the Israelites to be killed. So that means that for at least the 80 years, they had been under this tremendous suppression and oppression from the Egyptians. And yet God waited and waited and waited and waited until he brought his judgment against them. And I marvel at the patience and the long-suffering of God as he waits before he strikes in judgment. Also, I note that God had given to them preliminary notices that the day of judgment was arriving. God had begun to destroy their crops. He had begun to smite them with plagues. These were all forewarnings that the day was coming. The patience of God is wearing thin and the day of God's judgment is approaching. And so he did not just walk in one day and wipe them all out. He gave them foreshadowings, forebodings of of the coming day of judgment. He gave them still the opportunity to turn and to change and to escape the hand of God's judgment upon them. The patience and the long-suffering of God often lead people to dangerous, false conclusions concerning God. Because God does not strike immediately. Because God doesn't instantly destroy you when you've done something wrong. Or when you get into a, a practice that is not good. Because God deals patiently and, and mercifully with you. Many people misinterpret that as the, that God is weak. That somehow God is not able to judge. That uh, he really isn't concerned with the issue at all. That you're in reality getting by with what you're doing because God really doesn't care. There is even in some places, people who vainly imagine that God actually is in sort of a tacit approval of what they are doing. 
Because if God didn't like what I was doing, then why hasn't God done anything? Why didn't God smite me? You know, I'm still happy. I'm still being blessed. I'm still prospering. If, if God didn't like what I was doing, then why didn't he wipe me out? And therefore they assume that God actually approves of what they are doing because he has been so patient in dealing with them. Because he is so long-suffering. The Bible tells us that God is slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And we are also told that this patience of God, this long-suffering of God is really that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a false concept we often have of God. We think that God is constantly angry with us. God is just waiting for an excuse to wipe us out. That somehow there, there exists between God and man this kind of a uh, enmity that, that just God can't wait for me to do something wrong so he can really just pull the rug out from under me and, and make me suffer for a while. And when I do something wrong and the rug isn't pulled out and I'm not suffering, I say, well, maybe God doesn't care that I'm doing this, you know. Maybe he even approves. And it leads to further misunderstanding of God. God is loving. God is patient. He watches. You know, I, I looking back at my own life as a parent, I, I realized that I made some real mistakes as a, as a parent. I, I confess to you that I was a poor disciplinarian. I let my kids get by with a lot of things. I did just sort of turn the other way. Or just sort of ignored. And I find the same is true with my grandkids. I'm just poor disciplinarian. They can get by with murder. <laughs> and, and grandpa just smiles. And I say, isn't that cute? You know, and, <laughs> and, and I have also noticed, though, that there are times when they are almost testing their limits, baiting and to just see how much they can get away with, you know. But disciplining the children was to me almost the last resort. I, I just didn't like to do it. I would take an awful lot just hoping that maybe they'll change their attitude. Maybe they'll quit mouthing off and shut up and go to their room, you know. And they but finally, finally, there comes that point where they, you know, have gone too far and you say, all right, you know, and all right, this is it. Well, God is much that way. You know, he takes an awful lot from us. He's so patient. He is so kind. And he takes and he takes and he takes and he takes. But there comes that day. There ultimately comes that day when God said, well, sorry, you've gone too far. That day had come for Egypt. They had gone too far. God must now judge the Egyptians and God had appointed a day when he was going to judge them. On the 14th of April, Egypt is going to come in for judgment. The day of judgment had been appointed. And it is interesting that the Bible tells us that God has appointed another day of judgment for all man. We don't know the date as yet. But there is a day coming. God has been patient. He's been long-suffering. 
He's been extremely tolerant. But ultimately, ultimately, the righteousness of God must prevail and God must judge. God declared to Moses that he was going to bring his judgment against the gods of Egypt. A person's God is that which they have placed their trust. Whatever a person is really believing in and trusting in. A person says, well, I believe in myself. Well, then you're your own God. Well, I believe in good works. Good works becomes your God. Well, I believe in my bank account. And your bank account becomes your God. The Egyptians had many gods. Your God is not only what you believe in, but it is that controlling factor of your life. What is it that you're really living for? What is that dominating ideal or, or force that, for which you are living? That underlying principle that sort of determines the w way which you're going to go, the thing that you're going to choose. That becomes your God. And God is going to, in judgment, come against the gods of the Egyptians. And when God's day of judgment comes, none of these other gods can spare you. When God's day of judgment arises, all of your good works are not going to avail one iota. All of your wealth can't buy you a single thing. All of your philosophies are going to disintegrate. None of these things can save a man. When the day of God's judgment finally arises, he is going to judge the gods that you have enthroned in your life. And God declares that he is the one who is going to execute the judgment against the Egyptians. There are things that you should know concerning the judgment of God. And number one, it is certain there is no escaping of it for any man. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. In Hebrews we read, That if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect the great salvation? In reality, there is no escape. You cannot escape the judgment of God. It is certain. It is sure. But we also know that the judgment of God is final. You can't appeal to any higher court. You can't say, well, the policeman didn't read me my rights when he arrested me. And therefore, you know, I appeal, you know, I wasn't warned that what I might say would be held against me. Or he didn't have any right to search me. 
and it was unlawful search and seizure, so I appealed to a higher court. When God's judgment comes down on you, that is going to be final, and there is no appeal, no changing, no amending of the judgment of God. It's final. You've been judged by the highest authority and you've got no place to go. But God's judgment will also be righteous so that the determination that has been made by God for each individual will be right. No one will be able to walk away from the judgment bar of God and say, hey, I got a bum rap, man. Because that which God has adjudged will be righteous. It'll be the right thing in every single case. But God's judgment is also severe. In Hebrews we read, He who despised the law of Moses was put to death if just two or three people bore witness against him. If you really spoke out against the law, if you said, Oh, I hate that law. I can't stand it. I wish we didn't have that law. And two fellows come before the judge and say, Hey, I heard him say he hated the law of Moses. They would take up stones and they would kill you. He who despised Moses' law was slain as the result of the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well then, of how much worse punishment do you suppose the person will be found worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, or who has done despite to the Spirit of grace. For we know him who has said, Vengeance, judgment is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. The judgment of God is certain. The judgment of God is righteous. The judgment of God is severe. It is a fearful thing, the author of Hebrews concluded, to fall in the hands of a living God. And so God declared, my day has come. I'm going to judge Egypt on this day. I'm going to go through the land and I'm going to bring my judgment against the gods of the Egyptians. But God also, in proclaiming His coming judgment, also proclaimed the way by which the judgment of God could be escaped. He said to Moses, Go out before the children of Israel and instruct them on the tenth day of the month to take out of their flocks a lamb of the first year without blemish and set it aside. And in the twilight of the fourteenth day of the month, in the evening, they are to slay that lamb and they are to put the blood of that lamb in a basin. And with a hyssop bush, they are to sprinkle that blood on the doorpost and upon the little of those houses in which they are dwelling. And that night when I pass through the land to judge the Egyptians, when I see the blood on the doorpost and the lintel of the house, I will pass over that house so that the firstborn will not be slain. So God provided the way by which they could escape the pending doom that was going to fall. Now, what if an Israelite had said, well, I don't see any reason to sprinkle blood on the doorpost of my house. That doesn't make sense to me. I'll just hang all my jewelry on the doorpost of my house and the Lord can know how wealthy I am. 
Do you suppose their jewelry would have sufficed and God would have passed over that house? No way. Well, I'll tell you, I don't believe in this blood bit, but what I will do is I will tack up a notice on the doorposts of my house and I'm going to list all of my charitable contributions for 1985. And all of the clubs that I belong to. And all of the good causes that I've become a part of. And, and I'm going to list all of my good works so that when God passes through the land, he'll see what a good fellow I am. And surely, seeing how good I am, he'll pass over. Had any of the Israelites endeavored to hang their jewelry or their good works on their doorposts, their houses would have been visited with death as sure as the houses of the Egyptians. God had provided the way of escape. The way of escape was through the substitutionary death of the lamb for the firstborn within the house. That lamb died in place of their oldest son. It was a substitute. And in seeing God providing a substitute lamb for the house, we begin to get the foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus Christ and that substitute lamb for our sins. How that God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. And Peter declares unto us, for we have been redeemed from our empty lives not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish. Take a lamb of the first year without any blemish. They were instructed. Put the blood upon the doorpost and the lintel of your house. Sprinkling it with hyssop on the lintel and the doorpost, you're going to be sprinkling the blood in the shape of a cross. And it was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed upon the cross where there was a substitutionary lamb, God's lamb, Jesus Christ, who died in your place and for you to provide for you a place of escape from the ultimate impending judgment of God which is going to come. But God provided the way of escape for those who would take it. And as long as they remained in the house, God said, when I pass through the land, they will be safe. Even as God has provided a place of safety and escape for you and for me in that coming day of judgment, that I do not fear the day of God's judgment. Though the earth be shaken and the mountains be removed and cast into the midst of the sea, though the heavens be rolled up like a scroll, I will not fear, I will not be shaken because I have found a place of refuge and safety in Jesus Christ and I am safe in Him. God has provided a place of safety for me. And I do not Fear the judgment of God, for I will not have to stand in that day of judgment. One has already stood for me and was my substitute. He took my place. But for me to try to escape the judgment any other way is foolhardy. For me to try to declare to God the terms upon which I will come to God. I will accept you, God, on these terms. Hey, I am spiritually bankrupt. I can't tell God on what terms I will accept him. I must come to him on his terms. And God is the one who has declared the way of safety and the way of escape from the day of judgment that is coming. And that way of escape is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his Son. 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. God's provided the way of escape. I must take it if I am to escape at all. Going down to verse 29, we read, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. The day of judgment was announced. The day of judgment was carried through. And there wasn't one that escaped in the land of Egypt except those where there was blood upon the lintel and the doorpost of their houses. And not one died in the houses that had the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. God passed over those houses and not one was judged or slain. God is love. That is certainly, I feel, the chief characteristic of the nature and character of God is that of love. Love that is beyond our capacity to really fully comprehend or understand. It is because of this love that God is so patient before he judges. It's the reason why he puts up with so much from us. And yet, love must be tough. Yesterday in the Dallas airport, my two-year-old grandson decided he was going to go exploring the airport on his own. And he took advantage of the fact that his parents were busy talking to some people. And I saw him take off running just as fast as he could go. And he ran out of the holding area where we were and got out into a corridor and began to run down the corridor. So I jumped over the wall to head him off. <laughs> and he saw me coming over the wall and coming towards him, and he turned and decided to run up another corridor. But I caught him, and about the time that I caught him, his parents realized what he was doing. I handed him back over the wall to his dad, and then I walked away because I didn't like to hear those swats that he was getting and those cries that, you know, my, oh, the cute little guy, man. <laughs> but I did not object to the swats he was getting. Though it hurt. Such a lovable little guy. I didn't like him getting swatted, but I didn't object because... I know that for his own safety and future well-being, he's got to learn not to just run off. I know that such a thing could jeopardize his life. And even though there was tremendous love, yet there had to be the pain. It had to be tough. It had to be stern for his own sake. And there is where we so often are misunderstanding God. The moment God gets a little firm with us. 
begins to correct us. What's the first thing you say? Oh, God doesn't love me. Look what's happened to me, you know. And of course, our little grandkids pick up. The minute you say something, you know, of corrective nature, say, you don't love me, do you, you know? <laughs> yes, I love you. No, you don't. You don't love me. You know, you let me do it if you really love me. No, it's because I love you that I don't let you do it. And I take this guff from you. <laughs> and so we are with God. We immediately begin to challenge God's love towards us the moment there's any correcting or disciplining. But we are told not to despise this chastening of the Lord. It's whom the Lord loves that he chastens. And if he didn't love you, he wouldn't chasten you. He'd just let you destroy yourself. He just let you go. But the fact that he is willing to stop and to turn you around is only because he loves you. But God is also righteous. And because God is righteous, it is necessary that the wicked be judged. Now, God has said, the wages of sin is death. God has also said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, in reality, all of us were hanging under a sentence of death. But God in His love has appointed a day of judgment but he has given a way of escape. As John the Baptist said to his disciples when Jesus came, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Those sins that destroy us and those things that bring us into judgment are the very things that he destroyed in his love for you by his death and substituting himself for you upon the cross. But if I don't want to go his way, if I want to work it out myself, if I want to say, well, God, I'm such a good person anyhow, then know this. God has made only one provision for your safety when that day of judgment comes, and that is in Jesus Christ. There is no other refuge. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I dare not try to substitute my righteousness or my goodness or anything that is of me, but must trust and rely fully on the provisions that God has made and on that place of safety that God has provided through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has appointed a day for judgment. The scripture tells us that. God has appointed a day when all are to be judged. No one can escape it. God has been patient. It's been a long time coming. But already we're beginning to see foreshadowings of the judgment that is to come. Are you in a place of safety today? That's the big question. Let's pray about it. Father, we come to you and we first of all want to thank you for the marvelous provisions that you have made for us through Jesus Christ. That he bore our sin 
He took our guilt. He died in our place. His blood was shed for us. And now, Lord, as we enter into that place of safety, we thank you, Lord, that not only is it just a shelter from the coming judgment, but it's a place of such love and glory and blessing as we learn your love for us and as we begin to fellowship with you. Oh Lord, thank you for your patience, for your long suffering, for your mercy, for your love, and for your righteousness. Amen. You are either in or out of the place of safety. It's just that straight. The Egyptians were out. Those who obeyed God's command were in the place of safety. And when God's judgment fell, they were preserved. You are either in or out by your own choice. You can choose to come into the place of refuge that God has provided for you through his son. And if you so choose, I would invite you to go back to the prayer room and just open the door and enter in to that place of refuge in Jesus. The pastors will be back there to help you and to pray with you. May the Lord be with you, bless and keep you in his love. And may you be enriched in all things in Christ as you walk in fellowship with him this week, learning more and more about God's plan for your life as you yield yourself to be his instrument to bring his love to others. In Jesus' name.